beautiful people. In this video, we're going to be talking about inverse relations and how to graph inverse relations, how to figure out the inverse of a function. It's a really fun video. I, I really enjoy inverses. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we jump into uh, what an inverse relation exactly is, disclaimer time, I am human. I make mistakes. Please learn from my mistakes and let me know where they are so I can learn myself. All right. So inverse relations. When it's asking you to find the inverse, it is a relation that reverses another relation. And honestly, this little definition or this um, statement to me sounds like it, it's going around in a circle, a relation that reverses another. Like, what does that even mean? So what that means is your domain and your x's, well, excuse me, your domain and your ranges, they switch. So what is domain? If you don't recall what domain is, that's okay. We're going to tell you right now. A domain are all of your x values. And range are all of your y values. Here's a trick, you guys, if you can sing the alphabet, I'm not going to actually sing for you, but if you can sing the alphabet, what comes first in the alphabet? Letter D or letter R? If you sing the alphabet, A, B, C, D comes first, then goes letter R towards the end. Now, if you sing that same alphabet, you're going to notice that A, B, C, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, V, W, X, Y, then goes Z. So X comes before Y. So X is first in the alphabet before Y is second. So because the letter D comes first, the letter X comes first, you know that domain goes are your X's because range comes second and then Y comes second, then you know range are your Y values. Just a little trick to remember domain and range because we will be using domain and range for the remainder of the school year. All right, so Inverse relations, that means your domain and your range switch. So all of your X values and all your Y values, take those and you, you switch them and you have an inverse function. Now, speaking of functions, we have to know that we have a one to one function. A function is one to one if the relationship, if the relation and its inverse Our functions. So what that means is the original domain and range for every x value we have y, one y value. Again, for every x value we have one y value. That's a function. So if we switch that for every y value we have one x value, both of them have to be true. It has to be a one to one relationship in order for it to be functions in one direction and be a function in the other direction. So how do we determine if we have a one-to-one -one relationship? We all know the vertical line test. Let's go ahead and do that. And I'm just writing here, it's the original function test. So vertical line test is the original function test. We know what that is. We know that from seventh grade, eighth grade, maybe freshman year. Um, so we know the original vertical line test. But with the horizontal line test, it's going to test if the inverse of that function is Let me, let me restate that because I'm going to be saying function too many times. Let's do this. It tests if the inverse of that relation is a function. Okay, so vertical line test, horizontal line test. If you take your pen and you go all through around, at every single time that relation touches your pen or touches that vertical line, should only 
touch it once. So here's my vertical lines. You should only touch the vertical lines one time at every given point. Now we have the horizontal line test. So if I was to take this pencil and point, put it horizontally and go through my relation, that line right here should only touch the pencil at one point at one each time. So for every X, there is a Y and for every Y, there is one X. Okay, so this is yes. The relation is one to one because it passes the vertical line test and it passes the horizontal line test. Well, let's try here. At any point, does the line touch more than once? In fact, it does not. So it passes the vertical line test. Now let, let's try the horizontal line test. At any point, does it touch it more than once? No, it does not. So yes, this is in fact a one to one function. So let's move on here. Again, vertical line test. Do I have any two y's for one x or do I have any two x's for one y? I do not. So this yes passes the horizontal line test. And the very last one, this one here. So it does not pass the vertical line test. Do you guys see that? It doesn't pass the vertical line test. Does it pass the horizontal line test? It does pass the horizontal. However, it does not pass the vertical line test. The answer to this is no, this is not one-to-one. -one. It has to be both vertical and horizontal in order to pass the one-to-one -one test. All right, let's go ahead. So this is graphically, if someone asks you, hey, what, you know, are these one-to-one -one functions, just use the horizontal and vertical line test to see if this is one-to-one. -one. Now, what we're going to be mainly focusing on is graphing inverses, solving inverses, and you know what? Let me actually do graphing a little bit later. Let's start out with finding inverse functions algebraically. We're going to find these algebraically, and then I'll show you how to graph them. Okay, so there are, the inverse function notation is f. It is not negative 1 of x. Okay, how do you read this? This is read the inverse function. Ooh, excuse me. So this is, how do you read this? This is the inverse function. So we're not reading this f to the negative one power. That is incorrect. It is the inverse function of x. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and find the inverse function of, of x. Excuse me, guys. If you heard my phone go off, I'm just going to turn my phone off here so you guys don't have to hear anyone. All right. So steps, how to find that? Step number one is you're going to replace f of x with y. And you're going to change x and y. Switch out. You're going to switch them out. Step number three is you're going to solve for your new y. And step number four, and step number four, I'm going to put a little star next to it. Uh, because step number four, a lot of you guys are able to find the inverse. However, for your fourth step, you don't actually write it as the inverse. And that's going to have your answer be as incorrect. So you need to make sure that you rewrite your y as f. See, I almost did it myself as the inverse function. All right, beautiful people, let's go ahead and see some examples. For example number one, we're going to apply all of our steps. So what that means is you're going to take this f of x and you're going to rewrite this as y. Everything else stays the same in step number one. Step number two tells you to switch the placement of y and x. So you're going to just rewrite everything, but instead of writing y, I'm writing x. And instead of writing x, I'm going to write y. Now, step number three tells you to solve for new y. So we're trying to get, at this point, we're trying to get y by itself. So I'm going to rewrite this 
just to make it prettier, give me some more space to solve for y. So I want to get y by itself. Here's my dotted line. I'm going to raise it up a little bit. I'm going to add 8 to both sides. We're going to remember our I am 1 or algebra 1 days. So I have 4y. These go away. I have x plus 8. And what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get y by itself. So I have y is equal to x plus 8 divided by 4. Now you can choose to sp split this into two terms. You can keep it as one term. It's, it's up to you. Now at this point here, this is the, what I was talking about, step number four. A lot of you leave your answer like this. That would be incorrect. This tells me that y is f of x, excuse me, y is x plus 8 divided by 4. y is not that because we don't have y. What we really have is the inverse function. What did we find? What's my objective is to find the inverse of our function, and that is our inverse of our function. Make sure you use inverse notation. All right, let's do another one. Oh, before we continue, make sure that the inverse exists. So make sure that you, it passes the vertical and the horizontal line test. Make sure it passes the horizontal line test because it's a function. It has to be one to one in order for an inverse to exist. So like this is the square root. We know that the square root, you know, imagine how it looks. We can use our imagination. If you're not too sure about, you know, with your imagination, just desmos.com is pretty good. You can type this in. You can see how the function looks like and see if it passes the horizontal line test. So this one here, again, step number one is rewrite f of x in terms of y. Everything else stays the same. And you can start to combine these steps. It becomes a little bit easier after you do a few. Ooh, step number three is rewriting, just kidding, step number two is rewriting x and y, switching the positions. And then we solve for our new y. We got to solve for y. So this right here is in a bubble. This negative is in a separate bubble. And then this minus 7 is in a third bubble. So make sure you, you separate bubbles. So I'm going to add 7 to both sides. Here's my dotted line. So I have negative root y plus 2. And this is x plus 7. So again, this is in a bubble. I cannot move anything inside this bubble unless it's the only thing. So I have this negative. So I'm going to multiply everything by, or you can divide. Let's divide. We can divide by negative 1. And what that does is this negative goes away and then these signs change. I still have my y plus 2. Now that this bubble is the only bubble that is there, now everything else has been shifted or moved. We're going to undo this square root by squaring both sides. Now, when you're trying to find the inverse of something, we're not actually wanting to expand anything. I'm not going to multiply this out and use FOIL. That's not our objective. Our objective is to get y by itself. So let's, let's just do that. Let's get y by itself and then call it good because we don't want to do too much work. Mathematicians are what? They are lazy. We are lazy, so we don't want to do more work than we have to. Again, very last step, make sure that you take your y and you get rid of it. We don't want y. We want the inverse function. All right, let's do a few more examples. Hopefully you're seeing the pattern. Okay, so this one here is the example that I wanted to bring up. f of x is equal to x minus 4 squared plus 6. If you graph this, let's see if I can quickly graph it. It will look something like this. So notice that it will not pass the horizontal line test. Let's see if you can see. There we go. It will not pass the horizontal line test. Here's my horizontal line. It hits twice, so it is not one-to-one. -one. So there is no inverse, okay? So um, does, you can write, for example, does not pass horizontal line test for that one. 
So be careful. There, there will be some tricky questions. All right, let's do this one here. This one is, okay, y is equal to x minus 8. This is x now. This is now y. Again, what are we doing? Oh, this is a good one. Notice how we have y in the denominator. So in order to get to y into our denominator, it has to be brought up. So you can do two things. Here's a trick for you guys. If you have one term on one side and one term on the other side, put a 1 underneath it and then flip both fractions. So this becomes 1x is equal to y minus 8 divided by 5. That is the same thing as taking this and multiplying it and then dividing by x on both sides. It's the same thing. But I recommend taking these two fractions uh, and then flipping them. It's a fraction is equal to a fraction. I'm going to multiply by 5 both sides. I'm running out of room. So 5 divided by x is equal to y minus 8. I'm going to add 8. And since I'm running out of room, I'm just going to erase 8 and add 8 here. And then I'm going to erase y and put the inverse notation. Again, just because I'm running out of room. Uh, one thing that I realized here is it asking us for the domain or for the range. Uh, it is not asking us for domain or range, but it's okay. I'm actually going to... Do I want to... No, it's okay. We'll, we'll do domain and range uh, on a different example. So graphing inverses. Graphing inverses can be extremely difficult, but I'm going to show you the cheater way of doing it. You know, mathematicians are lazy, so we don't want to work too hard, so I'm going to show you how to do it. So the first thing you want to do is identify your domain and range. So here is uh, when you're graphing inverses, two functions are inverses if they have r reflections of each other in the line y equals x. So what that means is, you know how we had a reflection when we were doing odd and even functions, we had a reflection across the y-axis. Well, this is the reflection across y equals x. So for every function that has an inverse, the inverse is going to be a mirror image across this line y equals x. So how do you graph it? The easiest way for me to graph it, you guys, is do domain and range. So domain are our x values, range are our y values. And you're just going to take numbers and you're going to plug them in. Uh, later on, we're going to do transformation of functions, so it'll be easier for you to graph with transformations of functions. But since we're not there yet, you're going to go old school, plug and chug. So if I have, I don't know, let's put a 1 in for x. 1 plus 4, that is 5. 5 squared, that is 25. 25 minus 2, that is 23. And you know what? That's a really big number. So I'm going to see if I can do for my output. You know, input is x. Output is y. So 23 is a big number. So I'm going to see if I can do something smaller. So I'm going to choose something like negative 3. Because negative 3, negative 3 plus 4, that is 1. 1 squared is still 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And that's a, that's a much prettier number. You're going to hear me talk about pretty numbers a lot. Pretty numbers are just the numbers that are a little bit more pretty. 23 is too big for me to graph, so it's not that pretty. 3 and 1 are much prettier. So let's do another small one. I'm going to do negative 2 because negative 2 plus 4, that is 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. Good, good, good. All right, let's do, oh, I don't know. Let's do a another number. Let's do negative 4 because negative 4 plus 4, that's 0. 0 squared is still 0, so my output is negative 2. And then you can start graphing it. Now, this is our original. We haven't done anything with our inverse yet. This is our original function. So if I have negative 3, so 1, 2, 3, and I have negative 1, so we're here-ish. Uh, then I have 2, 1, 2, and positive 2. That's here-ish. And then I have negative 4 and negative 2. That's here-ish. So what you're going to notice here's let's do negative 5 because that's another small one. Negative 5 plus 4, negative 5 plus 4, that is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So if I'm at negative 5, which is going to be here, it's okay. We can extend it. 
and I'm at negative one, you're going to notice that it's starting to turn back up and it's going to look something like that. Ooh. All right, I, I'm thinking about some things. I'm thinking, because that, that to me gives me anxiety. That to me is giving me anxiety. Oh, you know what? This is why it's giving me anxiety. There's a little thing that I forgot to write down. Do you see how we have this type of graph? And if I put my pen on here, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So that means we don't have an inverse. However, what I did forget to write down on this problem is that it says in this problem, if x is greater or equal to negative 4, what it's telling us with this statement here is that it, it, it has restricted our domain. That means that I can only take x values. I can only have my input greater than negative 4 or equal to negative 4. So this negative 5 that I had, I need to get rid of that because that is no longer in my domain. They told me that I have to have numbers greater than or equal to negative 4. So my negative 5 no longer exists. So this is how what we have. It stops at negative 4 and then it goes up all the way. And that's okay. I mean, we're just doing what it wants us to do. It's telling us don't, don't go x values smaller than negative 4. And it's like, okay. All right, so this is what I want for inverse. You have two options. Option number one is you can find your inverse and then plug and check numbers. I don't recommend that. That is a waste of time. If you are graphing your original function, this is going to be your new x. This is going to be your new y. And I'm going to label it as y2 and x2. What you're doing is you're switching your domain and range. Inverse is switching your domain and range. So your original value of y now becomes your new x. Your original value of x now becomes your new y. You're taking your domain and your range and you're switching those values. You're switching those values. Oh, I forgot one. 2 and negative 2. Again, you're taking your domain. That is now your range. And you're taking your range. And that is now your domain for your inverse with your domain and range. So now let's go ahead and graph that. I have a negative 1 and I have a negative 3. So here's negative 1. Here's negative 2. So negative 3 is about here. So negative 1, negative 3. Then I have negative 2 and negative 4. And then I have 2 and negative 2. Well, that looks weird. Let's try this again. Negative 1 and negative 3, okay. Negative 2 and negative 4, okay. And then, oh, do you see my mistake? I have positive 2 and negative, so that's why. Because I know that the inverse should be a mirror image across this y equals x line. That became weird when I had a point here. So now let's go ahead and connect. So do you see how they're kind of mirror image of each other? Again, I'm only human, so I, I'm not exact with my numbers, but it should roughly, let's make this one a little bit lower like that. It should roughly look the same. So how do you graph your inverse? Graph your original, plug and chug your points, take those points and you're gonna flip it over and switch them. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. So what do we have? We have plug and chug your points. And again, we want pretty points. Here's your domain. Here's your range for your original. We can say O for original. And again, for range, it's just your Y values. So what do I want to plug in here? Pretty numbers are the ones that give you a, a pretty result. I can plug in one in here because one plus three is four. And I know that the square root of four is two. So I know one is a pretty input. 1 plus 3 is 4, square root of 4 is 2, 2 times 1 half, which is the same thing as divided by 2, and so we have 2 as my output. So what's another pretty one? What can I add here to give me 
what I know. Well, the next one I know is I know the square root of 1 is 1. So what do I need to put in for x to get this to be 1? And that is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. And I know that the square root of that is 1. And 1 divided by 1 half is 1 half. Let's do another one. Oh, what's another good one? And keep in mind, this is the square root. So you can't have anything negative in the bubble. So you can't take a square root of a negative number just yet. All right. So then let's do what's another good one. I know the square root of 9 is 3. So I can take 6 plus 3 is 9. This is now 9. The square root of 9 is 3. Half of 3 is just 3 halves. Or you can say 1 and 1 half. One should be roughly enough, so let's go ahead and see what we have. I have 1 and I have 2, so I have a point here. I have negative 2 and I have 1 half, so right here -ish. And I have 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 1 and 1 half. Where is that? Here's 1, here's 1 half. Let's see what we have. We have something like this. And so let's go ahead and switch that out. Let's switch that out. And yes, that looks a little weird. Don't worry about that. Oh, you guys look. Negative 2. Hold on. What happened? Negative 2. I think we're okay. These numbers are, are giving me a little bit of a headache. So, so let me let me double check this because it's going up and it's going down. So I want to make sure that I, I graph this correctly for you guys. So I have one plus three. That's four. The square root of four is two. Oh, that's what I did wrong. Do you guys see that? This is wrong because what I have is the square root of four times one half. Square root of four is two. Two times one half is not two. That's silly. It is one. So this is now going to be brought down back to one. And so now it's an increasing function. That makes it better. All right, now that we have this, now we're going to take this and we're going to take the inverse, but just by switching the domain and range. So this is your new x and this is your new y. So we're taking these numbers and we're switching them. All right, so now I have one and one. Okay, that's still the same. I have one half and negative two. And I have one and one half and six. One, two, three, four, five. Let's pretend six is here. And that is like that. And again, you should see, and actually let's not do it this way, let's do it. Let's do it one half and negative two. Where's one half? One half is here, negative two is here. It's going to be something like that. Because here's two, six is somewhere here. And here it is. And it's across. Now, again, I just roughly sketched out my y equals x. If we want it to be exact, it's going to be like this. Here's my y equals x sign. So again, graph your original. Take the inverse by switching your x and y values. We're just going to plug and chug. All right, beautiful people, that wraps up this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to continue with inverses. Next up is the composition of functions. Super fun. As always, thank you so much for watching my videos, and I will see you in the next one.